Um, the, now we're going to talk about beef and dairy, um, and then we're also get, we're going to look at cow calf, uh, cattle on feed, and dairy. Uh, of course, in the Bay, dairy is the biggest uh, biggest manure producer, and also you'll see in the biggest mortality producer. But we do have quite a few. We have a lot of cow calf. They have a lot of cow calf, and most of those calves are gonna be shipped west to Oklahoma, Texas, and be fed out. Um, uh, they'll, they'll go to Oklahoma stockers and then onto the panhandle to be fed out. But there is some finishing, particularly in Southeast Pennsylvania. Um, some fairly large by Pennsylvania size, 2000 head uh, finisher operations. Usually they're under roof, but nothing like our 45, 50,000 head finishing for feed lots in the panhandle. Again, um, this is funded by the Chesapeake Bay program through Virginia Tech. And this is the result of, oh, well, the result when it finally comes out, uh, you probably could find it a draft version now. And if you go through me, I can get you a draft version. Um, but when this finally comes out, it will be the report of uh, our findings. And the same uh, expert panel. <laughs> But this uh, particular part on the cattle was really Tommy Bass is doing. In fact, I tried to get him to do this talk to break up the monotony of listening to me. Tommy is actually in Iowa now, uh, taking care of avian influenza mortalities. So he got called out by, the called out. He got, he's being paid by APHIS to help uh, compost dead birds in Iowa. So that's where he's at. I'm sure he wishes he was with us, although they pay you pretty well to do that. So again, what the Bay wanted to know was, uh, we also did horses, by the way, but um, the Bay wanted to know how many pounds of nitrogen phosphorus had the potential to get into the Bay through mortalities. And we found out compared to the manure, that was a fairly minuscule amount. Um, this morning, I was, we had about 100 people in the room, and the highest percentage, these are the nutrients of both the mortalities and the manure put together. So the percentage of the nutrients from turkeys is about 4%. So if you looked out the room this morning, and you saw all of them that were wearing a mask, that was about half as, 4% is about half as much as the people that are wearing a mask this morning. Um, when you get to uh, the broilers, I'm looking at nitrogen. Look at phosphorus in the broilers. That's about the percentage of the ones that was wearing the bright orange mask. And that would have been me, you know, wearing my patriotic o Oklahoma State mask. And then when you get to the cow-calf herds, the amount of phosphorus and nitrogen, you'd have to have a bigger population to demonstrate that. So it's a really relatively small amount, but not insignificant from a biosecurity standpoint or the rotten cow on the side of the road standpoint. We get some of that in Oklahoma, believe it or not. Dead animal disposal by, by making somebody else deal with it. Okay. All right. It's like a dead hog up here. <laughs> there we go. Okay, for cattle is again, um, cattle is what makes it a little easier is that at least for cow calf operations and also dairies, it's basically an annual cycle. Okay, if you look at a cow calf, he, uh, Tommy, was assuming that you're gonna have one calf per cow per year. You raise that up to stocker weight and then they ship them off. Okay, the, the production system they're gonna have. <laughs> primarily in Pennsylvania. And these are the weights at uh, the time at which they die. A calf at birth weighs approximately 80.4 pounds. I didn't know it was 0.4, but they're, they're quite precise. And these are the numbers he got from, uh, that's not me, Hamilton. That's another Hamilton. And uh, from data in Sanford is the beef specialist in Montana where he's at. So that's where the data comes, pretty good source. And then the mortalities were just applied the annual mortality on all the, the different life stages. 
uh, 3% born dead, 3.8 dying before they're weaned, and 1.73. Is it not working at all? Oh, like magic. Uh, anywho, so if you look at the annual death, uh, we're look the model herd would be a 50 head cow calf herd, 50 cows in Virginia somewhere, let's say, and they're going to have 1.52 deaths a year. You take that 3.8 and multiply it by 50, uh, and then died before weaning, and then you add up all the weights. So our mortality masses per year are mostly going to be, well, I think I totaled it the next, go to the next slide. Is uh, 1,600. So about, a, about three quarters of a ton a year. One thing that Tommy did, he assumed we have no dead cows, that uh, they're going to be cold before they die. And of course, that's not always going to happen. The other thing about cattle, particularly the larger cattle and horses, uh, we did, uh, for horses, we did a population of horses. We took what would be the entire herd of quarter horses, say, in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, and we'd say this many was going to die a year uh, at this age. And then we added up all the weights and then divided that by 1,000 and came up with uh, estimated mortalities per head, which is what the Bay wants to know. But uh, if you're a cow-calf operator or you're a horse owner, you may have a horse die on you, and that's a catastrophic event to you, no matter how many you've had over the years. So they're going to deal with a little bit different. And the same with the, with the cow-calf. One time I was walking in, along the Big Piney Creek in, uh, in Arkansas, and I just happened to get to this one place the same time the farmer found three dead cows. And he was quite upset, so I kept walking. So, so it does happen. Um, but for, for this particular, um, we did not look at that. So if you take it back to the, the amount of deads per mother cow, back to that 50 cow, divide the 16, 15 by 50, about 32.3 pounds of mortalities per cow. Um, so you can go to the census bag. If uh, Franklin County, Pennsylvania has 10,000 cows, boom, you got how many dead cows you ought to have. Right. And the interesting thing about this, I guess it's interesting, our greatest uh, source is going to be the, the, the calves that are about 400 pounds and less. So we have less dying, or the, the mass of them dying is our greatest mass. Cattle on feed, a little bit different on that one for the cattle on feed. Um, Tommy's assuming that the cows coming into a feedlot are 400 and 600 pounds, and they leave at 1,000 to 1,200 pounds, and they're going to be there for 120 days, and it's a linear growth. Of course, it's probably not completely linear, but that's the simplification he put into it. And I think... Uh, he's assuming two turns per year. So the date on this one is going to be in headspace. So we have a small feedlot in southeast Pennsylvania, um, 100 head, which is that would be really small. That's more like your Virginia Creekside feedlot. Uh, for a 100 uh, head space feedlot, we're assuming um, dying per year for two turns is going to be your, uh, the first 30 days, 0 0.67 animals are going to die a year. And the average weight between the 300, uh, 400 and 600 is 500 pounds. So that's our mortality for that particular size animal. And you add them all together and 1,825. You know, it's, I tell my students, you know, this isn't rocket science. This is, and I politely say manure science. Um, you know, anything more than two significant figures is you're probably fooling yourself anyway. So let's say 1,800 pounds. You divide that by the headspace, and the headspace per year is about 180 pounds. But again, they're going to be dealing with that 600-pound calf or that 500-pound calf. And it turns out, again, it's the, uh, 
600 pound animal is the, our greatest con contributor to our total mass. All right, dairies, um, again, in, in the bay, dairies vary from a few that are uh, completely grass fed. And then we have some very large dairies. Uh, and we have the Amish dairies and we have the large commercial dairies, the whole gamut. This is again, the, um, the data that Tommy collected on the average weights of animals and the mortalities at the different life stages. I did ask him about, a pre about the born dead ones. He says, well, that's a pre-weaned calf. So apparently the dairy folks throw those together so they don't have a separate born dead and, and pre-weaned. So uh, that's the data. You put those together the same way. Again, the dairies work pretty much on an annual basis. A uh, cow will be being milked for 12 months or so. She'll be dry almost, no, excuse me, 10 months. Then she'll be dry uh, two months or so. So it's a pretty much easy to calculate on an annual cycle, unlike the swine. You put those all together for a typical dairy that's 100 head, which would be a typically small dairy by today's standards, about four, four and a half tons a year. Um, and then mortality, going back to head, about 90 pounds per head on a dairy. So if you've got, like the dairy we saw yesterday, 3,200, multiply that by 3.2, and you get about 300 pounds of dead cow a year. But as you're going to see in the next slide, the difference here is you're dealing with really big animals. Usually that 1,200-pound cow is going to be the majority of your, your death loss. Uh, I would tell you about the farm we have in Oklahoma that has they had 8,000 head and they got in trouble because of their dead animal disposal. It was really out of hand. So, so for uh, mortalities on the, for, for um, cattle of all size, probably burial is still going to be the number one uh, way of disposing them. You know, you have that, that big cow that dies, you're a small farm, you have a hole, you dig it and you put them there. Uh, incineration and composting, uh, Oklahoma, you all know Josh Payne and Brian Pugh, you probably don't know, but they were, they were revolutionary in the large animal composting, both horses and, and cattle. So we do a lot of composting of, of calves and, and cows in Oklahoma. Um, for the burial, generally you're going to be dealing for routine mortalities with the individual pit. So this is the, uh, actually... This is one of our publications, one of Brian and, and Josh's publications. Uh, you're going to size the pit to fit the animal. Um, I guess you could double over a little bit. but uh, So this is not the, the large trenches where you might put a whole herd of cattle in there. Um, so then the, you need to find a burial spot on your farm. The NRCS will say, this soil is good. You know, this is the high spot. Bury them. But then you got to think about once you bury an animal, you ain't digging that up ever again. Uh, Tommy has this great story. I should let him tell it, but he's dealing with dead animals right now. When he was back in Georgia, they were up in North Georgia because a developer uh, north of Atlanta well, wanted to build houses, and they came across an old poultry farm, and they found their burial pit. And if it's, it was kind of like uh, uh, Poltergeist, the movie. There's just all these dead, they, they were preserved after 20 years. They still had intact chickens in that facility. It was, the way he described it was pretty gross, pretty uh, disgusting. So the incineration, you're going to have to have the incinerator. They do make them this big. This is the most common. Easy burn is the trademark. They will sell you one that can handle up to a 12,500 pound animal. You got to get her in there. <laughs> but it takes a front end loader to load them, but uh, they do make them that big. Uh, and then for composting, this actually came out of Florida, but that's, that's a Brian and Josh's publication, basically. Uh, you're going to size it. Uh, for cover, again, we have the scavenger problem, the same as with the poultry, but also if you're using the wood shavings, and generally we're using wood shavings mixed with, with poultry litter to get a faster composting. 
you need to have that much shavings to, to get the carbon nitrogen ratio going. And you need to size for probably two years worth of mortalities if you have an area to cover that. Because like Melissa was showing, if you want real compost out of these guys, they're going to be sitting there for at least six months to a year. And that's the thing that when I'm talking with producers, the chicken producers, they don't realize what it takes to really make compost out of these guys. Uh, research needs. We need to find out if these are good. Numbers are good. These are probably pretty good. Um, but you know, how many people count the, the dead cows in, in Pennsylvania? I don't know. And uh, that's my third dog. That's Pepper. And like the dog who's fortunate enough to find two beds to lie on at one time, he's not. He's uh, averting his eyes to any potential questions. So I guess I could do the same. Uh, so any questions? I can refer them to Tommy, but I'll try to answer as best I can. Do you know why uh, a mid-feeding cow has a higher mortality rate? Say the, uh, oh, the question was, why did the mid-feeding? And again, that's what I'm going to refer to Tommy. But I think it's just like the, the, the chickens in a way, when they get there, they're still kind of young. And then when within 60 days, they're starting to get a little stressed. So the ones that are going to get stressed die then. And then toward the end, they're used to the, the, the program. So I think that's why it is. It's just a statistical. Actually, I go back to the mortalities. I think they were still highest at that, but also they're larger. So they're going to have more mass. But I think that's the reason. You have one in the back? Yeah. Do what? Um, I'm, the Rolodex is going to that. The question is, what of these animals are infected? And I guess I could go back to the uh, the uh, high pathogenic uh, avian influenza. The question is then. You're not going to deal with your own. APHIS is going to come in and send Tommy uh, there to kill, uh, take care of them for you. But they generally have the same methods. They're composting the dead chickens in-house. They're actually burying most of the cattle. We had a lot of cattle die. We had a fire. We, well, we always have fires. But we had a fire in western Oklahoma, killed like 5,000 cows. So we had 5,000 cows to get rid of, and most of them were buried. Harley and them were, they were already half incinerated, but um, I'd say burial was, was probably the, the greatest. Uh, as far as the, um, if the uh, other animal dies, um, our Department of Agriculture, our department in most of the states in the, in the Bay Area, they have rules, but basically you fall back on those five approved methods. And I'm thinking, oh, he left. Um, we saw that heat treatment. I was thinking that's not in the rules, but knowing our people, they'll probably say that's rendering. It looked like rendering to me. You know, it's basically this. Yeah. But the, what got me involved in this, besides getting involved with the Bay, because this is the second expert panel I've been on, um, third actually, second I chaired. But what got me involved is when Payne was in Oklahoma, we did a lot of the mass mortalities, but the county agents were saying, that's not the problem. It's the routines. These guys can't handle all the dead birds they have. You need to come down and start working with them. So that's why we, I was concentrating on routine. And then I saw the RFP and said, hey, I'll go get some bay money while I'm at it. So, so they're different. It's a whole different ball game when you're dealing with the day in, day out versus the, you know, you have to kill the whole herd because they have hoof and mouth or something to that effect.